Okay, I'm sitting down with uh, Michael Gombeski, New York Times best-selling author of the books uh, Level Zero Heroes and Dagger 2-2, Two Two, as well as, uh, would you say retired Marine or? No, for, former, former Marine. I, former I, did, Marine. Uh, I did eight years, eight years in the Marine Corps. Gotcha. Um, so thank you, first of all, for sitting down and talking with me about this. Oh, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Hey, no problem. Um, so I guess my first question would be, why join the Marine Corps? Oh, geez. Uh, because I actually, uh, because I wanted to fight. Uh, I, I joined up right after uh, 9-11, and it was kind of it was kind of cut and dry for me. Like, I knew I wanted to go into to the service to, to go serve in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, this is all pre-Iraq. Right. And I knew that, you know, going into the Marine Corps was probably going to be the best chance at actually going to uh, a war zone. And I honestly had no other idea of, uh, you know, what other branch of service I wanted to go into. You didn't even consider Army, Navy, nothing like nope. that, right for the Marine Corps? Nope. It was such a simple decision. Did your uh, recruiter take you to Red Lobster like everyone else and uh, tell no. you the benefits? No. I was actually I was actually pretty old when I enlisted. I was like 26 when I enlisted. Oh, that's old so for the Marine that, Corps. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's freaking ancient. Uh, so, yeah, there's, not, there's nothing he could really offer me. Uh, it was actually pretty straightforward with me. Uh, which is is kind of refreshing, uh, <laughs> considering some of the stuff that I've heard from you know a lot of other Marines and right. other other people in the yeah. service about getting duked in. Because when you're 18, they'll promise you the world and everything in it. Everybody's going to be a Navy SEAL. Right. Everybody. I don't care what branch of service you're going in. <laughs> so let's go forward a little bit. So did you have like a, a moment, you know, in the Marine Corps when you're like, wow, this is. This is it. Like my life's changing forever. Like when you first joined in. For a lot of people, they say it's like boot camp when they first meet their their DIs. Did you feel the same way? Yeah, I I, I mean it's all it's all a culture shock really, uh, because it's just something that normal people. It's just not normal. Right. Uh, the the whole the whole you know hemisphere of being in the Marine Corps. Uh, but then it, uh, you know multiple deployments. Uh, you know rolling with different units and things like that. You get to meet a. Uh, you know, with my job as a forward observer, I got to meet a lot of different uh, people and, and work with a lot of different uh, styles of units. So, I mean, I guess there really wasn't, a, I mean, every Marine has their 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 special moment. Like when we all get our, our Eagle Globe and anchors, like I got right. mine in San Diego. That's that's like the big deal. Uh, uh, prior to that, no, not really. I would say, yeah, when I got my Eagle Globe and anchor and actually became, you know, air quotes, a Marine, uh, that, that that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, completely understandable, especially, you know, everything you go through. It's like, wow, this is, you know, I've finally done it. I'm through boot. I'm through, you know, all that. Yeah, and that's that's just the beginning of all your fun. <laughs> right. Then you right. actually go to the Fleet Marine Force where, where you know, you start deploying and you're actually in a unit. Uh, and then there's a whole nother level of, uh, you know, being in the Marine Corps outside of boot camp. So once you, once you did boot camp and you did SOI, where did you go from there? Right into right into the Fleet Marine? Uh, no, you go from uh, school of infantry to uh, if, you know if you're not if you're not in the infantry, you go to your your um, your MOS schooling. So mine was field artillery. So I ended up going to field artillery, and then I got assigned to my first unit, which was 310, uh, out in uh, Camp Lejeune, which is a field artillery battery gotcha. or battalion. So so like, what does it mean to be field artillery? Were you Oh, I was, were you... yeah, I was, I was, I was an 0811, a cannoneer on a M1, M19 or 8 howitzer. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, so big 155s, not like Army self-propelled, not like Paladins. Right. Uh, these were the old uh, kind that were tow behinds, and you actually had to lift the gun wow. off the back of the truck. And You know the Marine Corps standard, if it still works, might as well use it. It was, it's, it's a shitty job. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean. All you're doing is you're you're moving artillery rounds, like, right. so they they lovingly refer to us as gun bunnies. But we're literally offloading like 155 artillery shells and putting them on the ground, and then five minutes later we're moving positions. So now you got to load all this ammo back up. It's it's there's no glory in field artillery. There's no glory. I love it. <laughs> so did you do that for like an Iraq deployment or? Uh, actually, by the by the time I did my first Iraq deployment, uh, Iraq deployment, the there was no real heavy artillery support uh, happening anymore. So they basically took all the artillery units 
uh, and other type of combat support ammo or jobs, and they turned us all into provisional rifle companies. Uh, so we all deployed over as a uh, you know just a regular line so company. They, yeah, that gets assigned to a you know to a patrol base, and right. we had our own sector. And uh, that was that was a good deployment for me because that was my first deployment where I actually got to be a squad leader. And uh, was that? you know, it was awesome. I, I mean, actually having Marines under your charge, and especially in a small group like that of you know anywhere from like 12 to 16 guys and uh, just having free roam to go patrol and do whatever. Yeah. Uh, that It's a good experience. I'm sure it feels like, you know, you're that small of a unit, you can really, you know, lead people and, you know, actually feel like you're doing something with them instead of, you know, higher yeah, the, up. Yeah, the, the, further, the further I could get away from, you know, an artillery round or <laughs> li lifting a big gun off of a truck, I'm like, man, all I got to do is carry this rifle on a pack. All right, let's do this. So, so what was Iraq like? Just hot and miserable, like uh, says? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, honestly, it, it's it's just like any war zone. It's it's just a matter of what your role is there and and what location you're in. Because you know, as they, as they say, your experience varies depending on who you are and what you're doing. Uh, it can actually it can actually vary quite a, quite a lot. So, is any any memorable moments from your uh, first Iraq deployment, or was that? Uh, <laughs> Any that I can share on the radio? Uh, let's I mean, see. Uh, there was you don't, a, there, you don't have to breach OPSEC. You no, know. no. We, we had, I, there was a weekend at Bernie's experience, but I, I can't really talk about that one. Uh, <laughs> there was one where I, I actually saw I actually saw a, so, so our job was so we were at this um, we were at the Syrian Iraq border in, in western Al Ambar. Oh, and we're fun. at this and we're at this border crossing which was in the middle of nowhere called Awalid. And there was a customs like a uh, facility there and a border crossing facility. Right. And ever since the war had started, so this is like two thousand five, and uh, since the beginning of the war, this this border customs area had never made a payment from, you know, like their bank. Or where they're ever collecting their fees, they had never never made a payment to Baghdad, so they just kept accumulating all this money and all this money. And they just kept it. There. Uh, they kept it there. <laughs> and then and then one day we had some, I don't know, if they were state guys or somebody came up and they're like, hey, we're bringing in a you know a Black Hawk to pick up this money, and your squad's got to go over there and help them move this all. I kid you not, man. We're talking like brown satchel bags. Uh, Wow, they they had to have been like two foot by three foot, right? Like a uh, satchel, like a satchel yeah. bag. And uh, oh my God, there must have been like thirty five of them, uh, just stacked with money. So it we, Iraqi we, currency, Syrian currency? No, no, it was all American. No shit. Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing I'm doing like quick math here because we loaded them all in the back of the seven ton, and we had to drive out to the desert a little bit to get to the uh, HLZ, and uh, I'm doing some quick math. I'm like, man, thirty five satchels. Uh, we, we, we put it up somewhere around like maybe $3 million. And as we're driving, we're like, nobody's with us. It's just me. I'm the A driver. I've got uh, one of my guys driving and then I got one guy in the back. So I'm like, that's three people. I'm like, what happens? What if, what if happens if we just took one of those satchels and just like kicked it off the back of the truck? <laughs> that's a lot of trust then, right there. That's a lot then, of trust. And then went out on patrol that night and like buried it. And that we had like this, we had this huge master plan we had put together. We we're gonna fly back to Damascus and come across the border and pick it up. But, yeah, until, until the Jags uh, figure out what happened. Yeah, and, uh... yeah, we never did it. But but those but those are the types of things. I mean, you know, I, that's the last that's the last you know spot I'd ever thought I'd, I'd see you know three plus million dollars uh, in the middle of the desert in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Sounds like the beginning uh, of, a, of a terrible movie. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just weird stuff. Yeah, Three Kings. I'm pretty sure they already did a yeah. movie about it. That's awesome. So I had some people ask me, because um, I took some questions from the audience here. Uh, what was your first taste of combat like? Uh, it was that first Iraq, de Iraq deployment. Uh, I mean, we, our, our FOB had got uh, hit by a, a, a VBIS, so a suicide borne vehicle IED. Uh, and the difference, you know, one of the big differences between Iraq and Afghanistan was the size of the IEDs. The ones in Afghanistan are mostly made out of uh, homemade explosives. They don't pack that much of a punch. Uh, but when you talk about like Iraq, where you know there's just endless supplies of artillery rounds and ordnance and things like that, like these things can be massive. 
And uh, I remember, I remember it detonated. It detonated in front of the fob, and we found the engine block behind the base. Jesus, uh, about about uh, like 150 meters away. So it had chucked this engine block into the air, up over the fob, and uh, that's that was like at, at that point in the war, it was all about IEDs. Like they knew that they couldn't go, you know, toe to toe in just a regular street fight. Uh, so it just kind of became like a like a hit and run uh, type of war, which is extremely frustrating uh, when you know you can't really identify the really can't identify the enemy and just kind of blends in with the populace and they just take pop shots and that things must like be that. Just aggravating and and anxious and just absolutely yeah, it sucks. It it wears on you a lot. Yeah, I had I have to imagine the stress of it all the time of like okay this this could be it this could be it right here. Yep, there's yep there's been a couple of those. Um, so was it your first Iraq deployment? You made the transfer to uh, fire support. I did that after. Let's see. No, that would have been my second deployment. So at the end of my first four years, yeah, I decided to say goodbye to the gun line because uh, I knew because I joined the I joined the Marine Corps because I wanted to serve in Afghanistan. And up to that point, by the time I got into the deployment cycle. It was like all Iraq and everybody. Like what the fuck are we doing in Iraq? Yeah, yeah everybody all, <laughs> all, all, all but forgot about Afghanistan. Uh, so that was that time of you know the decade where everybody just got sucked into Iraq deployments. Uh, so I knew I was going to stay in, but I knew for sure that I was not going to be doing artillery anymore, or or actually lugging rounds and working the gun line anymore. So I decided to go over to become a uh, a forward observer because with the battery. You know, every time we would go to the field, and we'd go to the field all the time to train, like in artillery, it's nonstop. So I always remembered, I'm like, there's like this small group of guys, there's like six guys, and every time we go to the field and it sucks, these guys leave the unit and they go to this magical place called the hill. And they sit there and they have their binoculars and they're looking at the impact area. They don't have to lift any artillery rounds. They sit there, they eat bags of Doritos. And, you know, when the time came, I'm like, hey, man. Like, how do I do that? I'm like, I want to eat Doritos, man. I want to sit <laughs> on the hill. So so I jumped over to become a forward observer. And it was uh, it was an awesome move because the whole world of fire sport is just, it's just intriguing to me. So it was just a, it's just a great move. So, so as a fire supporter, what is it exactly that you, you would do? Just call in artillery? You would be attached to a like a rifle company like how would that work uh we our, our home unit so whenever we're back in in the states and stuff we're attached to an artillery battery that's kind of like our parent unit and we train with them and then whenever we deploy uh batteries deploy in support of infantry so uh whenever we deploy would be linked up with our sister infantry battalion or whatever it is and then all the forward observers get pushed to the line companies so my section would go to an infantry battalion, and then each one of my FOs would go with a line company and be their forward observer. And then we were the fire support infrastructure for that battalion. So you were uh, like the fire support chief then? You were in charge of a bunch of FOs? Yeah. yeah, I was the liaison chief. Gotcha, gotcha. So I would work in the battalion, uh, the battalion fire cell. And I would have my radio to all of my Ford observers out with the different line companies. And then we'd deconflict and process, you know, call for fires and things like gotcha. that. So they would call, you would go through it, you know, transmit it, make sure everything's all good, and then send it through to the guns? Yeah, yeah, I send it over to the battery. That sounds, that doesn't sound too bad, actually. <laughs> no, it's, it's not that bad, but, you know, when you get chalked over to a line company, you go over to the infantry, it's, it's a whole other world. Right. And, you know... The art, your artillery battery, which is is your home, is your home unit. You know, they don't, they don't really. I don't, I don't say they don't really like you, but they really don't know you because you're always detaching from them. So you're like those guys that are kind of around. And then when you go over to the infantry, you're like those guys that aren't a part of the unit. So nobody really likes you. You're kind of like the redheaded stepchild of of support, bouncing between units. Uh, but they all love you when it's when it comes time to call for fire. Yeah, it's you know nobody wants you until they need you. Um, all right, so I guess that's afterwards you became selected to become a, a JTAC, a forward air controller, correct? Yep, I did a, another deployment in 
a wreck and and then I served on the I believe it was the 24th the 24th mew out of uh, Norfolk and then uh, that last deployment I had to Iraq I just it was time for me to, to either you know get out or uh, at, at about that time they start pushing they start pushing senior guys to schoolhouses and stuff like that start training the next batch uh, but it was around that time that this new thing Marsoc had started up and uh, they were hurting for uh, E6 uh, fire support guys or forward observers uh, to come over and start being uh, enlisted JTACs. Because up to that point, the uh, Marine Corps didn't have enlisted JTACs. It was only officers. I want to I touch on all of that, but I want to take a quick, quick break here, and then we'll uh, come back and pick it up.